Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our virtual panel, Back to Business for Downtown Minneapolis. Uh, I'm Steve, CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council. In a few minutes, we'll hear from our, our panelists. But before we get started, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. This is a, a live web conversation. So all of our great panel participants are at the mercy of their Wi-Fi connections. So we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that the force is with us for the next hour. Um, and also, uh, this conversation you just heard will be recorded to our social uh, media channels. So take a moment today to make sure we're connected if we aren't already. Uh, hashtag MyMPLSDT, MyMPLSDT. So thank you very much. And it's really a pleasure to introduce our, our first speaker uh, who has a very busy day. So he's going to jump off after he makes some initial remarks. But uh, Mayor Jacob Fry has joined us. And, and Mayor, I know when you get elected mayor, uh, you realize every day is going to be an adventure. You never know quite what's coming at you, but I can't imagine any mayor anywhere in the country or the world expected quite this. So thank you for stepping up to the leadership challenge that you've been confronted with, and thank you for offering some initial remarks here to kick off our panel. Thank you so much, Steve, for having me and to the Downtown Council for coordinating uh, this event noting how we're going to ultimately get back to business and I, I want to start off by just first saying thank you. I know that every business, every individual in the city and in the state has been in some way impacted by COVID-19. I know that there are so many entities out there that are struggling, some more than others, uh, and that you all have done some extraordinary work to take count of your employees to make sure that we're all compassionate and looking out for our neighbors, but also recognizing that we're no longer in, in a time where decisions are made, made simply based on dollars and cents, which is, is very much a, a, an, an often business mindset. We're, we're making decisions now based on lives saved and, and lives lost. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate the business community for working with us through this very difficult time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, nearly every facet of our lives has, has changed. Uh, just this morning, I uh, delivered the state of the city address through a tape. Uh, it was videoed and should be released sometime in the next hour or so, but I was in basically an empty room with a few staff members delivering what is normally a very prominent speech to nobody. Uh, and it's the first time in our city's history that we've gone that route, but the times necessitate uh, this kind of action. Um, so I'll, I'll give a, a little bit of a rundown of, of where things are right now, uh, and then a little bit of a rundown of where we're going, and then uh, looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists. Uh, and so I won't take too much time. Uh, as, of, as of right now, Minnesota has a confirmed case count of, of 4,181. Now that number will go up dramatically as we get more tests. Uh, and as I'm sure you've noted, the governor in conjunction with the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic have authorized a plan to get up to eventually 20,000 tests per day. And having those tests and having that dash dashboard for us to drive with uh, will allow us to get back to work in a structured manner uh, that accounts for some of the public health concerns. Um, we've had a couple 200 deaths so far in, in Minnesota, um, and we know that Hennepin County is, is a location of, of density as well as population, and uh, therefore you'd expect to see larger numbers on a per capita basis there. Um, still, we are seeing in, in Minneapolis specifically, we've got about 401 total cases. So it's 401 cases in Minneapolis, and that's out of 4,181 in the state. Minneapolis occupies about 10% of the state. So again, on a, on a per capita basis, um, you would expect Minneapolis to be higher than the state, simply because we've got a greater proximity of people as well as density. But we're about the same. Um, so about 10% of the state, we occupy about 10% of the total number of cases. And I think that speaks to a lot of the great work that our community members and our businesses have done uh, around physical distancing, which is a paramount concern. 
And I'll note that you know, a lot of people will confuse physical distancing with reducing the number of infections that ultimately take place. You know, the, the, the notion is that if we physical distance, we will reduce the number of people that ultimately get infected. And that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, we're not reducing the number of people that get infected. We're reducing the number of people that get infected all at once in a way that would overrun our hospital system, would cause even more homelessness and unsheltered homelessness uh, and be a paramount concern, especially to those that are operating on the fringes. Uh, and so that's what a whole lot of this work has been about. Um, I think there still needs to be some improvement as far as everybody following the physical distancing, but I, I, I do think that by and large, the data shows that Minneapolitans and Minnesotans are, are following these orders. Um, Minnesota right now, uh, or at least last I checked, had the lowest infection rate in the nation. And, and as I mentioned, the data shows that Minneapolis is right on track as well. Uh, and our state is now the home to what I believe is the country's strongest testing capacity, uh, which is important not just for public health, as I mentioned, but it's really important for business as well, because it allows us to, again, isolate and figure out where the virus is, um, isolate that individual and prevent the spread even further. Uh, we also know that some residents are far more vulnerable than others and that that tragic reality has been felt in our city in a major way and that upwards of 90% of the total number of deaths that we've seen are in congregate healthcare facilities. So assisted living, senior centers, uh, 85 to 90% of the deaths are located there. Uh, and so we recently in Minneapolis, I issued an emergency regulation uh, that was developed um, for congregate care facilities and it has stronger preventative standards. It makes sure that people are wearing masks when they're entering, uh, make sure that the temperatures are, are regularly taken um, and it allows for isolation techniques once an individual is noted to be infected. Um, We've set up hygiene stations across our city as well to help ensure residents who are experiencing homelessness have access to the supplies they need to meet some of their, their basic uh, health needs. And we're also just collaborating incessantly with, with community leaders and governmental partners to effectively protect the most vulnerable uh, among us. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of the news about our parks. We're trying to prevent the proximity and density of populations specifically around areas like our lakes uh, and we're dealing with that by opening up other streets, other boulevards, other parkways uh, to areas that are now free of traffic. Um, and that's going to be very important, especially as things get warmer. Um, as far as the where the city is in, in planning for uh, what will inevitably be an economic downturn, um, last year, thankfully, we did take steps to mitigate the effects of a likely economic downturn prior to COVID-19. We, we created a, a sustainable source for our contingency fund for the first time in years. And during a time when we were seeing a construction boom, we were very conservative with our projections for new construction permits, which was and is a significant source of, of revenue. Uh, so last year we were in fact bracing for a downturn, but you know, and those measures were important, and they certainly will pay dividends, but they now feel relatively quaint in the face of what we're confronting today uh, because we're seeing somewhere between a 100 and a $200 million shortfall in revenues from property taxes, fees, licenses, um, uh, construction permits, you name it. Uh, and so what we've done recently is we've been really proactive uh, enacting a spending freeze, limiting discretionary spending, limiting things like travel, food, fleet, other large purchases, We've placed a hiring freeze and uh, we're also moving towards a wage freeze as well to make sure that the, the actions we take now will prevent drastic actions down the road. Um, we've also put into a, a, an emergency gap fund and I'm not going to talk too much about that, but the, the, the focus of the emergency gap fund, sadly, we were not able to help and assist everybody who needs it, either in the form of housing or in the form of business assistance. Uh, we had to direct and, and target it to those that were struggling uh, the most. Um, and, uh, you know, the only final piece I'll mention here, and I'll let you guys get going, is that, um, is that 
as we begin to, to open up, what we're really doing, and the, the governor has used the analogy of, of turning a dial. We're, we're, we're turning the dial. This is not a all or nothing approach. This is not tomorrow where the bars and the restaurants and the sports stadiums are open. Um, this is a gradual approach that allows us to keep that pilot light of our economy going, make adjustments as we see what the data and analytics are revealing, uh, and then fully reignite the economic flame of our downtown, of our city, uh, once we're through much of this pandemic. And I know that there are some experts on this call right now that are gonna be dealing with exactly that. Um, you know, we are in constant communication with both them as well as, uh, of course, our governor's office. Uh, and, you know, this is going to be a new normal. Um, I mean, what, that's one of the only things that we can definitively anticipate is that this will be a, a new normal and we're going to collectively need to embrace it. And I just appreciate all of you so much. Again, thank you to the Downtown Council for organizing and uh, I'm, I'm proud to be in this with all of you. Mayor, thank you very much. You're Again, thank you for your leadership, and I think your remarks really set the stage well for the conversation we're going to have for the next 45 minutes, so thank you very much. Well, let's turn now to our panelists, and uh, let me ask them each alphabetically here to quickly introduce themselves and their role in their company, and then we'll get started with some, some questions. So, Christine, you want to kick us off? You bet. Good afternoon. Christine Ackerman, nice to be with you today. Uh, I am the Vice President of Human Resources at Sleep Number, and my Sleep Number setting is a 60. <laughs> okay, great. Dr. Hallberg? John Hallberg. I'm a family physician. I'm the medical director of the Mill City Clinic, located right by the Guthrie Theater, and I'm an assistant, or rather an associate professor of family medicine at the medical school. Great. And a familiar voice on NPR. <laughs> Thank you. Mark? Uh, Mark, you, you're mute. There you go. Yeah. I'm Mark Nierenhausen, President and CEO of Hennepin Theater Trust, and uh, we lead the Hennepin Theater District. Great, thank you. Vince? We lost Vince Thomas? Well, I hope we get him back. Uh, Lika? Oh, here we go. Hi, Vince. I'm. Oh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Vince, are you there? There we go. You're on mute. Vince, can you unmute yourself and just give a quick introduction? There you go. Yes, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vince Thomas. I am an academic dean at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. Great. Thank you. Lika. Hi, everyone. I'm Lika thomas -Zuka. I'm a real estate lawyer. I'm a partner at Bakery, Drinker, Biddle, and Reef. Great. Thanks. And uh, Phil. Yeah. Hey. Hey, Steve. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with you. My name is Phil Trier. I'm with U.S. Bank, and I'm the president of the Twin Cities Market. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks to all of you for joining us and uh, look forward to a good conversation here. Christine, let me uh, let me throw the first question to you as the kind of HR leader on the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you thinking about right now for sleep number and kind of what what's keeping you and your HR colleagues up at, at night as you think about this return to work thing? Uh, acknowledging that everybody's on a or mattress and sleeping as well as they possibly can. <laughs> right, right. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I, of course, I think I probably speak for many that I think what's on our minds and um, uh, daily, hourly is is continuing to balance our focus of keeping our team members safe, um, serving our customers, and ensuring business continuity all at the same time as this situation evolves and changes its form each and every day. It seems. Um, we are following local and state orders um, that are impacting many of our locations as most of our stores continue to remain closed. Um, but certainly in this, in this time, it's this uncertainty of recovery. Um, when will the consumer's attention be back? When will their confidence be regained? That's weighing heavily on our minds so we can think about planning. So forecasting and planning is a, is a current pain point um, as we think about being poised to grow again at some point in time. Yeah, and we've got a call tomorrow with some of your HR colleagues from down companies. Uh, you, you think that's kind of a common common uh, perspective right now? I, I would imagine so. It's again, balancing that safety for our team members, 
when in many cases, I hope we're all seeing, seeing great productivity and working remotely. Um, so balancing wanting to return to normal or the new normal with, with the balance of safety and health of our team. Yeah. Phil, from a U.S. bank perspective, I mean, how, how, how is the bank thinking about return to work? You've got both an office operation, obviously, in downtown, but also numerous retail locations. I mean, how does this look from your, from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Steve. And, and let me start by just thanking you for your incredible leadership. Uh, the downtown council, the work that you do, the advocacy. Um, we need you now more than ever. So thank you for Thanks. your leadership, everything that you guys do, including hosting us today. Um, as you know, financial services, we are an essential business. So we've been open. We've been hard at work. We've kept the majority of our branches open, and we have hundreds of U.S. bank employees who go to work every single day to help serve our customers. Of course, as Christine mentioned, our focus is really on protecting our employees and protecting our customers. So we, we encourage our customers to use our drive through if they need to come to the branch. If they need to come in, we have the opportunity to set appointments. We provided our employees with face masks and gloves. We have plexiglass barriers on our teller windows. We have them on our desks. Uh, we, of course, have a really robust digital platform as well that our customers use. But to the extent they need to come to the branch, we're here, we're ready, and, and we're ready to serve, and we're doing it every day. Um, we have a number of employees, of course, that are able to work from home and have transitioned quickly and, and have adjusted, frankly, quite well. Uh, we are thinking a lot about what does the return to work strategy look like? And of course, health and safety is at the, as, as at the forefront of it. We, we do know that it will be gradual. It will happen in stages and it will most likely happen over several months. We've got to rely uh, very closely and heavily with our national, state, and local uh, 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 officials. We want to think about the healthcare officials and their guidance, as well as the CDC. And when we think it's when we think it's ready, we'll start that process. But I want to stress it's going to be gradual. It's going to be in waves, and it's and it's going to happen over several months. Yeah, and and as as that gradual reintroduction of folks to the office, in, in particular, happens, how much of what's been happening now, kind of the work from home, will become more a part of that permanent approach to, to doing the bank's work, do you think? That's a good question. And, and we don't know yet, right? Um, I think we've adjusted well. We uh, certainly have adjusted both personally and professionally. So a number of our employees have, uh, have uh, school-aged children. I have four. And so <laughs> Uh, adjusting to teaching elementary curriculum and <laughs> engaging with your team. Um, I do find that when you are working virtually, you do have to lean in a little bit more and really work to keep that connectivity with your team. And these virtual interactions really help make that happen. But as we think about school, and if school remains closed, we know it's closed for the rest of the year. But if you start to look into the fall, we know that our employees, they might need the added flexibility. So I think we are willing and open to a more broader work from home strategy. I also think it changes the talent pool, right? So it opens and broadens the talent pool because you don't necessarily need people to be uh, geographically centralized. And so I think that's a really interesting thing we have to think about in process as well. So um, I think it's all up for debate and we'll see how it plays out over the next several months. Great, thanks Phil. Dr. Hallberg, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't start my, my question to you with a thank you to you and all of your colleagues in healthcare on the, on the front line of this pandemic. The word I most often hear is heroic, and that seems absolutely appropriate. So, so thank you. Thank you. Well, I should just, let me just clarify, though. I mean, I think that for those of us in primary care, it's interesting. There's a hierarchy in healthcare that those who are actually in the hospitals, you know, doing EMS work, you know, we put them in a higher category than us. And so <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful to be thanked. But uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that there's you know, those who are truly, truly putting their lives at stake sometimes. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. So as the mayor said, the University of Minnesota certainly has been noted nationally for kind of research in the COVID-19 uh, uh, realm. So could you maybe give us sort of the latest and greatest in terms of research findings? And uh, uh, how do you think continued public health guidance will shape this return to work conversation over the, over the coming months? 
Yeah, it is um, both um, exciting and humbling to be at the University of Minnesota to hear about and see the kind of research that's being done on a daily basis. And of course, by extension at the Mayo Clinic, but also places like Health Partners and, and HCMC. I mean, I think all, we, we, I mean, we're so lucky to be in Minnesota with the leadership that we have at all levels, with a citizenry that is you know, responsive the way it has been to social distancing and, and really trying to take care of ourselves and, and those who are more vulnerable. Um, what is interesting, and this is maybe a little bit dismaying, is that the more we learn about this virus, the more we don't know about this virus. Mm -hmm. And I think on a very positive note, I think it's still holding that the vast majority of people who get sick um, are either asymptomatic or have relatively mild symptoms. But for those who get really sick, who are in the hospital or in the intensive care units, um, their road to recovery is really um, gonna be tough. It's, it's, this is much more serious. And I think I say that, as a public health reminder to everybody that as we start to slowly dial up, you know, that dimmer switch, um, that, you know, it's, this is not over and we are gonna be really, really um, careful. Um, I mean, I'm so proud of my colleagues and the efforts underway to you know, mm -hmm. crank up the testing to 20,000 um, PCR tests, those are the nasal swab tests to tell you if you currently have infection, um, while at the same time, hopefully having 15,000 tests a day for antibodies. The trouble is uh, the antibody test simply tells you if you've been infected, you've been exposed, and you've mounted some kind of measurable immune response to it, it doesn't guarantee that you are now therefore you know, immune for ever, you know, ever getting infected again. Um, we just don't know that yet. And so there's a lot of um, uncertainty, um, but at the same time, my goodness, between the U of M, Mayo, and the Department of Health, to be able to offer that kind of testing is incredible. And that will allow us in ways that other states and, and regions don't have um, you know, that, that capacity, that ability to at least start to really get a handle on how many people have been infected and who's, who's um, had some kind of immune response to it. So that will absolutely help us uh, go forward. Right. From your perspective, are the channels of communication between the public health experts and the folks making these business decisions open adequately enough, or are there more that we need to do there to facilitate the kind of communication that will help make good decisions? Yeah, I think that the daily press briefings that Governor Walls has with Jan Malcolm, and you often see Mike Osterholm there as well from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the university, can't get much better than that. On a more granular level though, you know, it's like, so it's great to hear about those kinds of like, we're gonna do all this cra crazy testing. And then I come to clinic and it's like, wow, I'm having a really hard time getting this person tested. Yeah. If I'm in the U of M system, how, how can that be? And so I think we are, you know, we have to be uh, temper our response a little bit. It's gonna happen. We have to work out the kinks. Um, but yeah, I don't know if we could do a much better job at this point because, you know, every day those briefings are important. But as we are joking, you know, A, we're building this plane as we fly. Um, you know, there are guidelines in place that are changing, not just by the week, not just by the day, but sometimes within the day we're changing things. So I think probably you and business are much more adept at that than we are in healthcare. Um, we're pretty slow to respond. And this has really kicked us in the butt to, to pivot and be creative and innovative in a way we've never had to be before. Thank you. Well, speaking of being kicked in the butt, uh, Vince, uh, you all have had to pivot on a dime in, in education, higher ed, K-12, K uh, as of, as of mid-March. So um, kind of what has that been like for Minneapolis College, and you know, how do you think that might influence what you've learned in adapting to COVID-19? How might that influence even the fall semester and education on an ongoing basis at your institution? Um, you're correct, Steve, um, as, and, and uh, John also, um, higher education is not an institution that is generally known for being <laughs> nimble and uh, uh, open to change, uh, let alone uh, 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 doing anything quickly. That having been said, uh, at, at our college, uh, we were blessed to have very, to very quickly identify two objectives in making that pivot. Number one, uh, keep our students, faculty, and staff safe and healthy, as, as others have already alluded to, uh, as their top priority. And then second, get our students to the end of the 2020 spring semester with integrity. Uh, integrity being defined as no compromise of our academic standards or of the college's mission. 
And so uh, I think as for, for, especially for all of you in the business community know, if you can give the people uh, for whom you are responsible uh, as a leader, clear objectives, it really helps them focus. And I think more than anything else, um, what I tried to say to the, to the faculty for whom I'm responsible in every meeting was, let's remember what is it that we're trying to do here? We're trying to keep everybody safe and healthy, and we're trying to get everybody at the end of the semester with integrity. Um, our strategy for reaching those two objectives was really focused on shifting as much instruction as possible to remote delivery. And for those courses that had components to them that we simply could not teach remotely, identifying which ones those were, putting plans in place to try to teach them in person with COVID-19 mitigation strategies in place. Um, we, we thought we were ready to do all that. And then um, two days before classes were set to resume, Governor Walls issued the stay at home order. And so we, we then went to plan B, which was the face-to-face -face components will just have to wait until after the stay at home order is lifted and we will, uh, we will create special, uh, what we're calling now gap instruction uh, to teach out uh, that, 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 that component. Um, what we've learned about the, the particularly the, the distance learning piece, um, it's really confirmed some things we already knew. Uh, number one, distance learning, like all other education, uh, or all, excuse me, all other teaching, is not easy to do if you want to do it well. I mean, it, it is not simply taking your lecture notes uh, that you are accustomed to delivering in person um, and turning them into PowerPoint slides and putting it uh, into like an online learning system and, and it's, it's all good. It's online learning uh, is really requires its own unique infrastructure and not having for courses that didn't have that in place already. Faculty have found some faculty who've been teaching literally for decades have found like it is not easy to do this well. Um, and so we knew that already, but I think we have had that confirmed for us and we know that now going forward in a way that we didn't before. Second thing we've learned uh, that, that confirmed something we suspected already, students like to be on campus. And uh, not just students uh, at traditional four-year residential universities like, like the University of Minnesota and St. Thomas. Um, students at our college, which we have no residence halls, we have no sororities or fraternities, um, we have no theme housing on our campus, but even our students, all of whom are commuters, they, they like to be on campus. Um, and they have told us quite clearly that they are anxious to get back. Um, the third thing we learned uh, is that um, access to devices, um, as well as access to reliable high speed internet is a barrier for some of our students. We have been surprised by how many of our students have told us I don't have a laptop. I only have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And so now you're asking me to write a paper and the only device I have is a smartphone. I don't have a laptop or a printer. Um, and so that's, that's a barrier that, that the minute you go into any kind of remote delivery has to be accounted for. Yeah. Um, the good thing, or at least one good thing has come from this though, is that we've, we found that students really like the flexibility to access lecture materials or other course materials online 24 seven. And I had one of my instructors tell me, Vince, you know, we probably should have been putting this stuff up there like this all along. Yeah. And, and I told him that's Greg, we're gonna learn things that we wanna keep doing even after yeah. this is done and that's, that's good. That's great, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Lika, we've talked about the fact that the practice of law of course continues, it must but in a very different way. So how have the social distancing and stay at home orders affected the way that you and your colleagues interact with clients and similar to Vince's point, and, and the question I asked is Phil, how much of that may stay even as things begin to get back to whatever the new normal is? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so the practice of law was definitely um, preparing with technology for the last, I don't know, five, 10 years to be able to be more remote. Uh, more people travel for work, more people need to work from home for different reasons. So particularly, particularly in a law firm setting um, where flexibility is one of the things that we sell for 
you know, keeping people at law firms. Mm -hmm. um, being able to work from home has been a really important factor for, for many years. And so the switch from everyone being in the office to everyone being at home was um, probably more seamless in that regard because we were able to, at least with the timekeepers, the lawyers, the paralegals who could oftentimes do their work from home um, could just switch to doing that. I think it's been harder for our staff, so our secretaries, our accounting teams, who didn't necessarily have that flexibility before to work from home. So I think though, going forward that um, now that we know that it's very possible to work from home um, with some uh, challenges, obviously I still mentioned the, the kids at home and trying to get, manage their schooling. So there are those challenges, um, but the flexibility obviously does afford us the ability to stay home with our kids and help them with their schooling as long as schools are closed. Um, the virtual meetings, I think, have been very helpful and people are becoming more comfortable doing that. Our clients have been super um, flexible. Everyone's kind of in a similar situation, which is helpful. Um, and being able to kind of bring our authentic selves and... Speak <laughs> <laughs> like, like, kids at home. There we go. Um, Having, having the ability to bring our authentic selves to work every day and the ability to interact with our clients in the same way has been a really great bonus, actually. So right. that relationship building has been deepened, which I think everyone appreciates and we hope will continue. Yeah. Bill and I were just discussing last night about how Zoom calls have invited us into each other's homes. So that's, uh, that's very, very, uh, very nice. So Mark, I left you last purposefully because you I have talked many times about how businesses that are in the business of bringing lots of people together are probably at the end of this end of this line. What what do you as you look forward for HTT and, and other arts organizations and entertainment venues? I mean, what do you see uh, as you look down the road here for the next number of months? Well, the the, the moment there that we just saw the family the shared family moment with all of us really speaks to. Um, one of the things that we're acutely aware of is that we're more than just a business. We're more than just being in the public gathering business. When we talk about what builds community, what expresses community, what gives us a sense of community, we can talk about virtual work all day. We can talk about virtual meetings, but at some point we're social beings that need to come together as people. And we understand that and particularly my remarks now, when I'm not just talking about Hennepin Theater Trust in a Broadway series, I'm talking about that fundamental sense of what it means to be a community and how do we express that? How do we share those? How do we share being a community? And so for us, we look at a number of different things. And uh, first of all, we start with the comments that Dr. Helberg made, of course, it's uh, what is the medical, the best medical advice? We look to the leadership and guidance of the mayor and the governor and other um, uh, governmental agencies for guidelines. But assuming that's all in place, um, what we're finding is a couple different things. One is, especially in case of Hennepin Theater Trust, and I'm speaking on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Guthrie and the Walker and Mia and, and all the arts organizations, um, certainly we're realizing that we also have to think of other ways of connecting with people that we're not simply in the business of putting people in seats, we're in the business of connecting. And we've already been seeing that in a variety of ways. Um, our arts education program has gone online and we're actually reaching more students now than we ever reached before. Um, at, with the Hennepin Theater District and the Trust, we have a robust public art program. And I hope that some of you, if you've been out driving, you've seen the billboards. Uh, we have a partnership with Clear Channel and we're working with artists to uh, provide artwork on billboards throughout the city. We're continuing our public art program downtown. So much like we have the sculpture garden at the Walker, we now have uh, public photograph exhibit, photography exhibits in the district. Um, but ultimately we do want to get to the point where we hope we can get to the point where people can share those moments together. And it's important because the arts organizations and the entertainment sector is not just um, a nice amenity. Again, it's something that's essential from our social identity. It's an important economic driver that creates thousands and thousands of jobs, um, thousands and thousands of room nights, hotels, uh, restaurants depend on us. 
So we're acutely aware of the part that we play in bringing people together and, and helping to drive business ultimately for the downtown. I think someone in the hotel industry said that one of the first indicators of success will not necessarily be the conventions that have long lead times, but some of these performances. Um, you know, 30 to 40% of our Broadway audience are out of town visitors. So that, the, the importance of that goes far beyond the importance of Broadway and speaks directly to the business of this community that we all share. Thank you, Mark. So, so let me ask a question, maybe pair up Phil and John on this one. Uh, uh, Phil, what, what do U.S. Bank customers, what are they gonna expect of U.S. Bank in terms of interacting with your, with your staff, with your, with your bankers? What are they expecting? What will they continue to expect? And Dr. Hallberg, in that regard, what do businesses need to be doing? Should we all wear masks? If, if not that, what other kind of public health steps should really be put in place as, as this back to work begins to take hold? But Phil, what are your customers telling you? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And something we've seen over the last two to three years, especially is this move and adoption towards digital. And I heard my good friend, Peter Frosch say this earlier in the week, and I thought it was really spot on and I'll, I'll repeat it. And, I, and that is, I think to some extent or to a large extent, the stay at home experience has really pulled the future forward. It has really accelerated the adoption of digital. Now, there are, of course, a number of early adopters who are great on the digital uh, platforms. But perhaps for those of us that have been a little slower, this has really forced that into our lives. And I think about my own parents, you know, teaching them how to communicate via Zoom and work through that technology, helping teach them how to order online and that you can have your groceries delivered, right? So a lot of us are really becoming more accustomed to digital. I think of telehealth, telemedicine, all the things that we do routinely. My daughter had a dance class last night live via Zoom and, and it worked really, really well. So as we get used to these experiences, I think we become much more comfortable and that idea of pulling the future forward is real and we're all experiencing it every single day. At the bank, we've made huge investments in the digital process. So we're there and those tools are available and we're seeing that those adoption rates increase dramatically. I mentioned earlier, you still have some customers that need to come to the branch. They want to interact with an individual. They want that personal advice and thought leadership. And so we've taken the steps to be able to arrange that. We've got the personal protective equipment there. We've got the plexiglass barriers so that we can make our employees and our customers feel safe. And we can interact with them in the, in the environment that they, that they need us to and that they feel comfortable with. So I think we're well positioned, but that, this push to digital is real. And I think we'll see that lasting, that lasting impact going forward. Yeah, my comments will just piggyback just totally on top of Phil, you know, what we've witnessed in the clinic. And we've been open from day one. We've never closed. We've just uh, shifted. And we went from being probably 90% of our visits in person and 10% virtual to exactly the opposite. 10% uh, are in person, 90% are virtual. It's a little humbling to realize how much medicine can be delivered uh, in some kind of virtual way. And, you know, we've, we've um, instantly created a new menu. You can have a video visit, you can have a telephone visit, and eventually an e-visit. And so there'll really be four options going forward. Um, when people do come in, and I think whether it's our business, our clinic, or your businesses, I think that um, to get to the mask question, for some time, I think that that is a very strong visual reminder, if nothing else, that, that this, this thing is still going on. And as you all know, the, the cloth masks are not really personal protective equipment. They're not really PPE, um, but they, they serve as a way of, of protecting you know, our breath from infecting someone else potentially, but also there's some protective effect from larger droplets. Um, but I think it's a strong, almost like not met metaphorical, there's a real piece there. And I think that that will continue um, for some time. There's nothing magic about being six feet apart. I think we all know that that's just a good guideline. Um, but our social distancing, um, you know, having the plexiglass up, having lots of, op of opportunities to wash our hands, not touching our face, uh, all those things will continue as the businesses uh, start to open. Yeah, thanks. Well, let me pair up Christine and Lika on this one. And uh, maybe Christine, start with you. Uh, how has productivity held up during this period of time? And how are you, how are you measuring that? And then maybe ask Lika to respond to the same question. Yeah, it's a great one. I think um, we, it was, we're, we found ourselves in an interesting journey. We moved our corporate office from Plymouth to Minneapolis now nearly two and a half years ago. <laughs> and when we did that, we introduced um, principles that guide us still today. Um, especially for our corporate office. 
including this idea of work for your day, which was essentially based on your day, work where it makes most sense. Um, and that has helped us relatively smoothly, dare I say, move into this place where we're 100% remote in our corporate facilities. Um, so I'll keep that as my focus for this, the remarks here. Um, so, so productivity, I think, has, has um, the idea of working remotely and working productively has been quite smooth. You know, I think when you establish business continuity teams, steering and operating teams that are focused on the very near-term deal-breaking priorities, you get quite focused and you stay very focused on those. You wrangle the right resources you need to make the decision of the hour, minute, and day. Um, and I think because of that, we are, we're using agile methodologies, the very near-term decisions and how do we make the decisions when we need to make them. Um, but moving remotely didn't seem to affect us much. Um, the business continuity teams are helping us with clear priorities. So I feel like we've made market change on making really important decisions and moving our business forward and building some, dare I say, sales momentum because we've had some really creative solutions come from the cross-sharing and, and um, cross-functional teams that have developed. So right. we're feeling great. And I think um, we've, we've talked about um, necessity as a mother of invention. We never had con contact centers um, in, remote, in remote sites. They were always in their chairs issue a crisis like this and now somehow we figured out how to push through our own barriers and get our team members working from their home to service our customers. So again, really so many great examples of how productivity and how our work continues in a different way. Thanks. How does that look at the firm, Lika? Well, I think um, the level, um, the efficiency of our productivity has not decreased very much, but I think that the type of work that we're doing has certainly changed. I think that you know, obviously we're doing legal work for our clients and our clients in these kinds of situations, their priorities shift and we're all, including at the law firm, going into kind of, you know, budget review mode and trying to adjust our, our, our financial forecasts. And so our clients have done the same and any kind of what they might view as discretionary um, legal action, whether it's, you know, pursuing a lawsuit or defending an, a lawsuit or any deals that might be happening that they could put off for six months. I think they're all trying to preserve that cash flow so that they can um, address their more, more kind of critical financial needs right now. Um, but in terms of our workflow, while our workflow has decreased in that regard, um, there are new issues arising because of COVID-19, obviously. Our labor and employment um, attorneys are very busy um as well as you know our lawyers who analyze all the new regulations coming out whether it's regarding ppp loans or anything like that um what we're trying to make sure that we're doing honestly is trying to make sure that we are helping our clients the best way that we can with the information that they need and right now and most relevant to this discussion is that we have like a lot of other law firms have produced uh, materials for free that are on our website that are really q a guides on how to get back to work um, and considering the legal implications of how you do certain things, um, whether it's providing, um, you know, PPE or um, changing how work, uh, workplaces are laid out. Thanks. Mark, I know you pay a lot of attention to the, uh, kind of the public research that's going on around consumer sentiment and the willingness to come back together. Could you share just some of the insights that you've gleaned from, from that research about you know, when folks might be willing to get back together in, in communal settings and entertainment settings? Yeah. The, um, I think the, there's a couple surprising pieces of research and some um, just expected. I mean, the, the first piece of research is that, of course, um, people don't want to come back together again until they feel safe. And that's why I referenced the guidelines before. That's so important for us to not only understand the guidelines, but to communicate effectively how we're following them and as we work with our collaborators to make sure that we have a trusted sources of information communicating that. So we can put lots more hand sanitizers in the theater, but unless people know about it, it's not gonna make a difference. What is surprising to me though, is when we look at the data about people's intent to participate in a cultural activity in the next three to six months, we find that right now the response rate to that is virtually unchanged from when it was from what it was last year at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so 
that gives us a sense that there is a sense of optimism that people do want to come together again, that they do expect to be able to come together, assuming these conditions are made. Of course, there are differences um, if we're talking about the entertainment world and the public assembly sector or the arts world. Museums are going to have an easier time of it than maybe theaters, and there's going to be more constraints there. But the encouraging news, though, is that uh, people are expecting to come back and that the data hasn't changed that much from, from a year ago. So we're, we're optimistic, but we know we have a lot of work to do with our hospitality partner colleagues and uh, business colleagues in the city. <clears throat> Vince, you're, not only has the staff and institution had to make some quick adjustments, so have your students. And what, what do you think uh, they're going to take away from this experience that will actually be valuable, valuable to them as they enter the workforce and they look forward to their careers from here? Yeah, I think they will uh, take from this the, hopefully, the ability to demonstrate to prospective employers that they possess the skill of resilience. I'm sorry, not resilient, resourcefulness, yeah. resourcefulness. And of course, resourcefulness is that ability to, to use available resources to solve problems and achieve goals. And that's both a personality trait and a skill. But I think that students at um, all of the colleges who have campuses uh, in downtown Minneapolis, you think not just us, St. Thomas, North Central, um, <clears throat> Metropolitan State um, and, and the University of Minnesota, uh, uh, all of them have, have had to be resourceful in response to having their, their instruction shifted in the middle of the semester, but the, their instructor's expectations for them have not changed just because they're learning online and from a remote location. So they now have to, to be resourceful in figuring out how to do their best work, how to meet their instructors expectations in a location that was never probably never set up for them to to be studying at the college level and then if, when you add to that some of them are still had trying to meet the expectations of coaches if they're student athletes or uh, part-time employers uh, they've had to be resourceful and and they should have some experiences to report in a job interview that 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 show evidence that they possess that skill yeah great thank you well, why don't we wrap up with maybe a couple last questions and, and just kind of fairly quick responses and we'll go alphabetically up one way and, and back the other. And, and, and the first is, if you just kind of pulled out your crystal ball and we were all sitting here uh, in the spring of 2021, what do you think your world's going to look like? Christine, maybe start with you. Yeah, I, I think it was mentioned before. I think digital has come um, and it's here to stay. So we have always typically pushed our customers, uh, introduced them to returning to our stores for a great experience and learning about our products. And we are seeing an amazing um, response from customers who are getting clearly what they need online and in other, in their other uh, vehicles to learn about our product and, and purchase. Um, so I think that's going to be something that comes and stays along with understanding where should I work? Where do I get, where do I do my best work? And um, maybe returning to office is, is really not what we think it should be in the future. Yeah, interesting. Dr. Halpert, what, what do you think? Well, outpatient healthcare will no longer be a one size fits all, uh, you know, enterprise. It'll be a menu. You'll have, uh, we collectively, both within the clinics and patients will have a chance to decide what is the best kind of visit for them that makes the most sense. I'm actually inspired by the greening of healthcare. People will be able to drive less and, and not to worry about parking and, and getting to places. So that, that um, is really something I look forward to. And I'm hoping in the spring of 2021, when you come to the clinic, you'll be rolling up your sleeve and getting a COVID-19 immunization for those of us <laughs> who have not been infected at this point. So that's my really high optimistic uh, yeah. hope. Absolutely. Mark? Yeah, I, um, I, share the, uh, I share the thinking that business is going to be done differently, whether it's digital. Um, I, I like Phil's comment about pulling the future forward. I think that's very much a case. I know it's even in the entertainment sector, we're thinking differently. Um, I think one of the things that we're also seeing is new forms of collaboration and a heightened, <clears throat> a heightened awareness of the need to collaborate across sectors. And um, without sounding too touchy-feely in a business meeting like this, I think uh, we're going to see a real appreciation of what it means just to be able to come together with our 
um, other people in the community, that all these things that we took for granted, the human touch aspect of our lives, I think, uh, I hope there's a new appreciation for how much that matters in all its expressions, not just in our theaters, but across the board. Yeah, yeah, well said. Vince? Um, thank you. Uh, I think, when I think of spring of 2021, first and foremost, I go back to something I said earlier, we've learned in a way that we didn't really know before that students like to be on campus. So our students want to be back on campus. Our campus is in downtown. So therefore, our students are going to want to be back downtown. And so when our, our colleagues who are in that, the, the, particularly the hospitality, the restaurant, the retail uh, lines of business, our students are your customers, are perhaps also your part-time employees. They are going to be anxious to be back downtown when it's a time uh, for, for everything to be open again. Um, but like Mark, we also rely in higher education on bringing large numbers of people together in one place and, and our students aren't going to come back until they feel comfortable and safe uh, coming back. And, um, and so I am very much with Dr. Hallberg uh, looking forward to that day when we can say to our students, you can, um, you can receive a vaccine that will put you in the same position with COVID-19 as you are with the flu or other uh, yeah. respiratory uh, ailments. I think that, that that will be a breakthrough for us as well as for everyone else. It won't be exactly the same for all the reasons that others have already said, but I do think that at the core, um, students will want to have a more traditional higher education experience again. And for, for our students, that means they're gonna be back downtown. Okay, thanks. Lika, what's your, your outlook like? Um, I am, I think like everybody at the firm, probably very much looking forward to everyone being back in the office. Um, I think that the flexibility to be able to work from home for not just timekeepers, the lawyers and the paralegals, but for staff, accounting, you know, any, any person in any role. Um, I hope that that flexibility remains for people who really need that flexibility from time to time or all the time. Um, but I think this experience has definitely given everybody um, a chance to really appreciate what they are now missing is that human interaction and community building them to office. Good, thanks. Bill, what do you think? Yeah, Steve, um, I can't help but be optimistic about the future. Uh, we are resilient. We come together. We collaborate. We're compassionate. I agree with Mark. There's going to be a greater sense of community after this. And I think that's a really good development. I believe in our healthcare uh, partners, professionals, and colleagues, and they're working around the clock to bring medical advancements uh, that I am hopeful will bring us back to uh, life as we knew it. There will certainly be some new subtleties to that, but in many respects, um, things will remain the same. And, and I think both elements of that are good. So I'm optimistic. Uh, we will get back. Uh, we will be open again. We'll be operating and we will uh, feel good about attending the theater uh, and seeing all the wonderful shows that, that Mark hosts and kids will be back in school. Um, but I'm optimistic. Thanks, Steve. Great, great. Well, last question, and let me, let me start with you, Phil, and then we'll go back the other direction. Uh, to kind of get to that future that you all imagine a year from now, what can organizations like the Downtown Council or the civic groups or what can the public sector do to kind of help business get to that, get to that point? What advice would you have for us? Yeah, I, I think the public sector has done a phenomenal job, and I really appreciated Mayor Fry's comments, the fact that he took the time and, and walked us through what he's thinking about, how he's leading. It's incredibly important. And us in the private sector really need to rely on the public sector to lead us through this and, and be our partner. Steve, your advocacy, as I started, has been phenomenal. The work that you do, you and your team being advocates for all of the business community, um, but much more than that, really helping make sure that downtown is thriving, that it's safe, that it's clean, that it's green. All of those things are important. So I would just, my plea to you uh, would be to continue the great work and we are here to support you um, in any and every way that we can. It's, a, it's definitely a team effort. Great, thank you. Lika, what advice would you have uh, for us? I agree with everything that Phil said. I mean, he said it really, um, really well. I think that the optimism, I think the communication is obviously the key um, and what the Downtown Council provides and providing that communication between um, industry sectors, I think is really, really very important. Thanks. 
Vince, any any thoughts? Um, I'm uh, share the optimism that uh, that others have uh, expressed. I think from from the public sector, what I'd add is um, that awareness that we all have now of the importance of access to high speed internet that mm. is not 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 just available broadly across the city but reliable um you know we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing now for our students without that and i think everyone's alluded to that increased comfort with the digital uh well that's gonna mean more more demand for that almost as almost like a utility so not lo not not losing sight of that but then the other piece i'd say um for our fellow members of the council or the, the downtown community that, that whose organizations have as their mission being part of that social safety net, knowing that for the short, for the near term, um, there, we are coming back, it is gonna be good, but it's gonna be, as, as in past recoveries, uneven. Um, right. Not everyone's gonna recover at the same pace. And one of the things that I think really distinguishes Minneapolis from every other major city in the country, if not, in the world is the strength of its combined public private um, uh, set of organizations that that provide that social safety net uh, that help people be them their best selves um, in in situations like the one we're going to be confronting in the near term I think that's that's going to be really important and we can't lose sight of that thank you mark uh, unmute mark unmute there you go. I think the um, I think this has demonstrated the importance of the public sector. Um, that business can do a lot of things, the private sector can do a lot of things, but the public sector role in providing information, setting standards, fostering communication, um, articulating policy—all of those things can't be understated um, in terms of their importance. In helping us where we are now and moving us forward. So I echo what everyone else has said that we really, and the downtown council is a perfect example. Collaboration doesn't just happen. Collaboration is something that is encouraged and fostered and facilitated. And whether it's the governor's office, the mayor's office, or things like the downtown council, it's extraordinarily important right now. Dr. Hallberg. Well, I think we just need to continue with what I'm thinking is the Minnesota way, and that is to let science inform good policy. Uh, when policy is in place, we, the citizens of the state and the city, need to follow that policy and be patient. And if we can do that, I mean, we already have the lowest, um, you know, per capita uh, caseload in the country right now, and I think it's because of those pieces, and we just need to continue with that. Great, thanks. Christine, give you the last word. Oh boy. Well, I think it's all, it's a summary and amalgamation of what you just, what we've just heard. And I think that um, we're uniquely in this, in this situation together, right? And we are absolutely in it together and we'll be better because of that. So forums like this, leaning on the experts that have been, that have spoken and have been um, contributing uh, to the call today um, and others in the, in each of the sectors will be really important as we work through it together and succeed together. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks to each of you. Uh, this was really a, uh, a, a very rich discussion over the last hour. Thanks earlier to, to Mayor Fry as well for taking the time to sort of set the stage for this conversation. And you know, I would just remind everybody uh, who is tuned in that this panel will be available on the Downtown Council YouTube channel. So you can uh, look it up in the future and we'll also provide notification about future panels of this of this type that we'll, we'll probably be putting together uh, to continue this conversation. So. Uh, we've adopted the motto, uh, strong today, stronger tomorrow, and I believe very on that. So uh, we will live those words. And uh, thanks again to, for being with us. Uh, say, be safe and, and be well in the, in the, in the uh, days and weeks ahead. Thank you all.